from the first first round trying to take my head off and then uh second round I touched his body up, knocked the wind up out of him. Uh, and he was like, he grabbed me, leaning on me like, hey, work on your speed. Yeah. Work on your speed, man. I fight Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> but I got some. How it's nice. Oh my mama, I can show you how to run it up Came from nothing, now we ballin', baby, look at us We can cash out on whatever, but they know it's us This how I feel when you ring side with a line up Phone, will she drive, let the seats inside Diamonds on the neck, you riding with a line Every day we let you go and enjoy this ride Thankful that we made it, what a time, be alive Thankful that we made it, what a time, be alive all right, we are back in another episode of Lifeline. I have a very special guest in the building. I got this guy that I got to watch how I talk, you know what I'm saying? Because I might get punched out in the studio or something like that. <laughs> no, no. Nah, just like, go ahead and introduce yourself, bro. Man, my name is William Ricardo Langston, none other than the kid, you yeah. know, a professional boxer, born and raised here in Kenosha, Wisconsin. How you feeling tonight, sir? I'm feeling great, man. You know, um... I fight exactly a week from today, mm -hmm. so I'm in camp right now in yeah. preparation for this war I'm getting ready to. For those viewers at home, where will the fight be? Um, it's in Rosemont, Illinois. It's located at the Dome at the ballpark uh, in Rosemont, Illinois, yeah. Yeah. How can we purchase tickets or see the um, event? People can purchase tickets for me personally. Otherwise, they can get them, I believe, on Ticketmaster if not there will be tickets at the door and there will also be a live stream link that's posted on my instagram yes, ricardo sir. the kid three is the instagram and i'll make sure i try to share it or whatever stream it, whatever i can do for you loyal listeners at home today as well too right. so i hear you say you're from kenosha just tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in kenosha for you oh man it was it was it was rough it was rough i mean as people know it's still it's still uh hard times we dealing with stuff like we dealing with the Rittenhouse case and stuff right now, you know, um, rest in peace to Anthony Huber. That mm -hmm. was a good friend of mine. Oh, wow. I went, yeah, I went to middle school and in and, and high school with him. You know, I knew him very well. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I grew up, um, I was a skater. Oh, know, wow. Really? 10, 11, 12, 13 to the time I was 14, I was a skater. I would have never guessed that. Yeah, I, I would have never guessed that. Everybody look at me like, that's a street dude. What? What? I was actually yeah. just talking to my guy the other day. I was like, man, this cat was telling me so many stories. I was like, I would have just never guessed that that was him. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. perception often becomes a lot of people reality, too. Yes. And I try my best to get away from that, like seeing how people act or what they do. And I'm like, oh, I would have never imagined them to be this. You know, yeah. people say the same about me. I've done a lot of things, though. You know, I've 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 been in a lot of places, you know, a lot of situations and I've hung out with a lot of different people. Um like some of my friends people be like oh you know him what i would have never thought yeah you knew him because of what he does or you know <laughs> but uh growing up for me you know in kenosha i had i can say i had the right role models my grandfather was reverend Wright. Mm -hmm. a lot of people know him um he was the president of the wisconsin branch of naacp oh wow um big community activist in kenosha so that's something that I'm really big into. I am a really big community activist, uh, and I do a lot of stuff in the community. Um, my guy, Nathan, uh, he actually does New World Order. Um, that's his group. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually did a peace protest uh, called the Uptown Revival, mm -hmm. um, and I helped him lead that march. Oh, wow. Know? And we've done some other things with, uh others like equi uh equitine i know y'all probably never heard of that one. no but well they're 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 young they're about uh 15 16 years old young kids was just crazy to me mm -hmm. um they put this march together and it was like thousands of people there you know oh, wow. kenosha news is there and i actually helped lead the march with that too you know this is all things that i believe in you know i just want to keep peace in the city you yeah. know around when they were tearing the city up uh, for the Jacob Blake incident, and it all started uh, with the George Floyd. You know, mm -hmm. they started tearing stuff up, and then that happened, and it caused the uproar. So, you know, we wanted to bring peace and you know more love and abundance, you know, um, to the city. So that was something that I'm uh, and I was, and I still am deeply involved in, and that I believe in. I was raised in a church, <clears throat> um, 23rd Avenue Church of Christ. 
Oh wow, right. Yeah, no, right sure. on. I know exactly where yeah, that is. That's right, the spot. Yeah, right in the right in the center of the city. Mm-hmm. Um so I was raised around uh, you know, the north side. I know y'all know. I'm from the uh, north side yeah. too, so yeah. Thirties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they like to call them the dirty thirties. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was my that was that was where we grew up around, you know, uh, relocated to the south side. And then uh I moved down south for about a year, year and a half. And uh I spent most of my time here in Kenosha. So I know the city like the back of my hand, but I, oh my bad. It sure. was it was it was uh growing up here. It was it was rough. It was a bit rough. Um, I got to see what people, you know, how people really felt about people of color, you know, oh, wow. because of um the way my grandfather was treated. Um, I've heard stories from my grandfather, um, with him telling me that. He's gotten calls from the deputies and sheriffs and telling him to walk into the lake until his hat floats. You oh, know? wow. And, 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 yeah, and just crazy stuff. And my grandfather was from, he was from down south. He was from Mississippi. But uh, he relocated here and they had 10 kids, five boys, five girls. Oh, wow. And my mom was one of those girls. Yeah. So, you know, I had a good upbringing. And um, unfortunately, I just veered off into the streets. You know, I my father wasn't in the household as much as he should have been. So I kind of veered off and started, you know, kind of doing my own thing. Around what age would you say that was? Um, I would say around like 10, I started to be interested, you know, and then around 11, 12, I hopped off the porch and I was in the streets full fledged. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. I 11, was out, 12? 12 years old. I was out smoking weed. Yeah. Hanging on the block with guys that are 20. 25 close to 30 years old and they knew who I was yeah. you know they knew who my grandfather was and they used to always call me church boy choir boy because I was a part of the choir but um none of them made me get off the block they let me stay out there yeah you know so I stayed out there as long as as long as I was allowed to yeah. you know and because I didn't have uh my dad at home around those times um my mom was raising four girls and me and my brother, that's not even her son. Mm-hmm. It's my father's son. So, you know, she got a house of six kids and one mother working a job, sometimes two. Yeah. She didn't really have a lot of time on her hands, you know. But uh, I'm not going to lie, my mother made more than uh, enough time for us. And um, even though we struggled growing up, she made it happen. I don't know how. Yeah. But we didn't miss a Christmas. That's black moms for yeah, you. Yeah, we didn't miss a Christmas. Uh when we struggled, the only reason I knew we struggled is because I would catch my mom breaking down at some point in time, but she would never let us know that we were struggling. Mm-hmm. It was just I knew the struggle from the feeling, you know, and and I could see it, you know, and 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 feel it through the energy. Mm-hmm. And um I'm very intuitive as I believe I get it from my mother. So um, I could read things differently. Even growing up as a kid, being young, I was very smart and hip to things. But that was because I was really in tune with the streets and, you know, the spiritual realm because I was raised in a church. So uh, I was a little bit more advanced than your average 10 to 12 year old. Yes, sir. Now you say you were 12 when you hopped off the porch and were out there. Were there any things that like shook you up? Because obviously with you being around people that age, pretty sure they were involved in situations that would have shaken up any 11 or 12 year old. Um, Yeah. Uh, I've seen people get shot. Oh my gosh. Uh, I've watched people cook dope, sell weed. I've actually sold dope at as young as 13. People wow. put dope in my hand, tell me run outside and go hand it to the guy in the car. Um, So yeah. Uh, a lot of things were traumatic to me. Um, believe it or not, like the first traumatic event for me was like I was like six, mm-hmm. I believe. Um, my dad and my mom, excuse me, matter of fact, I was younger than that. My dad actually and my mom, they, it, you know, growing up, it was a lot of, you know, drama in the household between my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. Uh, My dad was going through his own problems, battling addiction. 
um, stuff that we still haven't even touched base on. But, you know, I'm getting older. So, you know, I'm I'm able to sit down and actually have these conversations with them. But I just rather in these times not indulge in those type of conversations with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I watched my dad. uh, Handcuff my mom to a pole in the basement. You know, and oh my God, and leave her down there, and uh, me being, I believe, as young as about two, and this is crazy because I remember this stuff like it was yesterday. And my mom's like, "How do you remember stuff back to when you were two? Yeah, like it's just not normal. And I and I really remember these things because she she didn't tell me this. It was just like I was a kid, and we'd be talking, and I'd be like, "Mom, you remember this?" Yeah. And she like, "What?" Nigga, what? That's and, funny that we're the same way. But I'm like, uh, my dad had went to my grandfather's house, and my grandfather, I'm speaking about Reverend Wright, and uh, I never seen my grandfather this mad, but yeah. you know, that's his daughter. Uh, my grandfather threw my dad out of the house. You know how I feel? Yeah, when he throw jazz out the house? You know, I'm not even <laughs> lying to you, man. This is like... It was exactly <laughs> like that. And this is crazy. That happened before I ever seen Fresh Prince. Yeah. So I seen that first. I was like, whoa, they got that skip from my grandma. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that that kind of shook me up. And then my grandfather, I was really close, like super close to him. That was my dad. You yeah. know, that was my father. Um, so when I seen that happen, right after that happened, uh, you know, usually they dropped me off to my my grandfather, because I wasn't even at, in school at that time. And that's how, you know, I was, how young I was. Yeah. But I remember that like it was yesterday. Oh, my gosh. And uh, my grandfather looked at me and he was like, you want to stay? And I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> he just threw my dad. Uh-uh. <laughs> and I was scared. But, you know, I was a kid. I didn't understand what was going on. But it was all because of incidents that took place, you know, with my mother and my father. My my uncles didn't like my dad. I watched him jack him up numerous times. Oh, you know? no. Yeah, so... Uh, just a lot of, it was a lot of stuff. More of my traumatic events were in the house versus in the streets. I went to the, the streets for, you know, that coping mechanism to avoid the conflict that you would see at home. I like, I like the, the guys looking at me, you know, I was a little kid. I like to do pushups, pull-ups, stuff like that. And they used to call me little Bruce Lee. Um, my sisters, um, my oldest sister Tia, her, her father. Uh, Dwayne, he used to fix a lot of stuff for us around the house. Anytime anything was messed up, my mom could always call him and he would come and fix stuff for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would always come around and he'd see me. He'd be like, nigga, you cut. <laughs> like, you all the way cut. I'm a, you little Bruce Lee. That's little Bruce Lee right there. Yeah. And I always just was like, yeah, I like that. <laughs> so then I started getting hip to the Bruce Lee and I like Kung Fu and end up taking up Taekwondo in, be- in behind that. Oh wow! Yeah, oh, I did wow. taekwondo for three years. I ended up becoming a uh, was it? Um, I believe my last belt was a brown belt. Nice. So you were yeah. moving up the rings pretty quick. Yeah. So how was it that you like ended up getting out of the streets? Was it the taekwondo that saved you? Um, no. To be honest, I didn't get out of the streets until I was a full grown adult. Oh wow! So prison you... saved me. Oh, so you went to prison as well too? Yeah, prison saved me. How'd you end up there, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I ended up going to prison for possession of a firearm by a felon. Uh, so I was already a felon. Um, growing up, like I said, in the streets, I got into a lot of fights. Uh, surprisingly, people don't ever think this. They always look at me like, man, I don't know. They, 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 Because I do what I do now, they're like, I must have been the big kid. Man, I was a shrimp. Yeah, I was a shrimp, dude. I was the little kid on the block. I was the P, you know. Yeah. Um, I was the runt of the bunch, and for the longest, man, my my brother, who is surprisingly really small compared to me, my brother's got to be like five six, five seven, maybe like a buck forty. Oh no, a buck forty soaking wet. At least one eighty, right? One seventy five. Yeah. yeah, and my natural weight is like two fifteen. I'm six two. Yeah. Oh wow. But I walk around at like one eighty five, one ninety. Mm-hmm. But um. Yeah, I was a small kid. I was a runner of, uh, of the bunch, and then I just I shot up. So um, I got into a lot of trouble, batteries, batteries, batteries. Uh, as a juvenile, you know, detention center stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, community impact program. Then uh, as I became older, 
um, 17 uh, batteries. And because I was 17, I was closer to an adult. They charged me as an adult. Uh, Yeah, my... So from the time of 17 to the time of 24, I spent all those birthdays incarcerated. You know, so within those, you know, five to six years, uh, I probably seen maybe three months of freedom within those, yeah, in in spaces of time. Oh, Um, my gosh. Yeah, it taught me a lot about myself. So I really developed as a man on my own and, and, you know, just taking lessons from a lot of the older guys that were in there, 40 years old, 30 years old. You know, you're going into the county. I'm seeing guys in there that are 60 70 years old, and I'm like, what in the hell? They're for life, I think. How? how? And no, not even for life. They're just still making the same, same, same bad choices. You know, they're still because at that age, I don't feel like it's a mistake anymore. You know, yeah, you've been there that many times. You look at his bracelet, and it says he's been in he's been in the county jail 32 times. Stop like, playing. He's been in prison four times. Like, damn, man, you done did a 10 year bid already. You didn't think yeah. after the 10 years, you would have learned. So, you know, um. I did a year. My first time in the county, I did four and a half months. My first time. And I spent my my 18th birthday in there. So when I got out, I was like, man, this is free again. And then 60 days later, I was back in. Bam. Then I was back in for a year and a half. I spent a year and a half in the county. Uh, I was blessed enough to get on Huber. So I got to leave the jail for work and come back. So I had, you know, a little bit of freedom. Um which showed me appreciation for my freedom. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I got out two months later, I caught another charge, which was my gun charge. And uh, I ended up going to prison. I ended up getting three years in behind that. Um, then after that, shortly I got out when I was released two and a half months later, uh, I received another prison sentence for just petty stuff like, uh, Smoking weed, missing appointments uh, with my PO. Um, I didn't cherish my freedom at that time again, and I had just did three years, so they snatched it away from me. Uh, And when they did that, it taught me the biggest lesson of my life because that three-year sentence that I did, I lost my cousin, um, rest in peace, to the London. Uh, I lost my cousin to the streets. He was hanging out with just some random people, you know. Yeah. People he wouldn't have been hanging out with had I been out there, you know. But uh, I'm not going to say it was his fault, you know. I I was told on, you know, by my family and, you know, by people who I thought was my friends that were in the car with me when we got pulled over. Yeah. They didn't find a gun on my person. They found it in the car. But they obviously told, you know, I end up doing a prison sentence. Four months into my, into, you know, me fighting the case, I'm still fighting the case. And I call my mom one Saturday morning and she's like, he's gone. And I'm like, what? Like, what? And it was just, it was just unreal. And to me still, it's, it never really settles. You know, when you lose someone that close to you, um, it hits different. Yeah. You know, so still to today, you know, I deal with, you know, those traumatic events. But um, when I went back, uh, it taught me a lot because I feel like everything you go through is for a reason, okay. you know? Are you a believer in God? I am a strong believer. So I'm a believer in God as well, too. He puts us in these situations that make yeah. us realize that we need to... And I know that had I been out here when that happened... um. I probably would have did some stupid stuff. Yeah. Or I might have been with him when that happened, which would have ultimately probably ended my life. So God had a plan for me, you know, and my life was put on hold and I was in the box for a while. Um, what was the most important lesson that you learned from being locked up all the time? Man, cherish your freedom. Cherish your freedom, man. Um Anything and everything could be taken at, taken away from you at the drop of a dime. And, you know, 
people, places, and things. You know, I was taught this growing up, people, places, and things. You hang around the wrong people, you do the wrong things, you're in the wrong places, a lot of times the wrong stuff is going to happen. Yeah. So you got to watch, you just got to watch your surroundings. So now I, I keep the circle real tight, real, real tight. Ain't exactly. too many people that could say they even hang out with me. You know, I got four boys and a fiance and I stay at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, They don't even see me. As much, you yeah. know, because I'm in the, the gym. Grind, yeah, the grind. I'm in the gym, the, the and I'm right. yeah, and I'm grinding for them. And uh, my grind also is for for the streets, you know, for kids that grow up like how I grew up. You know, I want to end that. So I'm also uh, right now. I'm working on a non for profit um, foundation called Punch for a Purpose. Yeah, that I'm getting ready to. Yeah, it's 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 all in the works right now. I'm writing you. up a I business plan because I want to take the youth from the streets and just show them. You know, um, there's a lot of people that are doing stuff out here, but they're all older, you know, or um, I ain't racist, but you know, the kids ain't gonna listen to no old white man or no <laughs> old white woman. You know, they're not, and and these people understand that you gotta have somebody that lived what these kids are going through and that understand what these kids are going through. So that way they can be like, oh man, look at what he's doing. I did a group with uh Curtis Strange with some young some young kids, and uh they were excited, like, you know, they got to meet with a professional boxer, and it was just like, man, it made me feel good to know that these kids look at me like I'm a celebrity, that they look yeah. at me like I'm somebody because really I ain't nobody. You know, I You're come somebody. from, God has a you know, I, well, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on it, but you know, um, I'm very humble. You know, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Uh, and, uh, I'm blessed to be able to do what I love to do, you know, and I'm passionate about it because I know that by me doing what I'm doing, I'm going to be able to use this that I'm doing for a platform to do so many other great things. So yes, this sir. is bigger than myself. No, I definitely feel that. So how was it that you transitioned your pain in your journey into boxing? Um, So I was, I, I, I am a recovering addict. Um, Yeah. So giving us all the details online for life. Trying so we to cope. Appreciate that. Yeah, trying to cope with things, man. It's it's hard, especially being a black man in this community. Mm-hmm. You know, um, they want to lock you up for every little thing. You smoke some weed, you're going to jail. Yeah. You know? It's not funny, <laughs> it's but like, just the way you said it's, it. It's real, man. It's real. <laughs> like, But you can go right across the border and get it for, for the legal. Yeah. You know? It's legal over there. But, you know, it's not legal here. So, you know, you got to follow the law either way. But, um... Just uh, it's it's hard. It's hard. It's hard trying to cope with things. You know, I didn't have a father like that, you know, so coming out from prison and the first thing I did was wanted to hang out, you know, party, hang out. Um, I did a year on parole. I walked the year successfully. No violations. No nothing. What's crazy is. I, 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 I'm glad they didn't, well, I mean, I did stuff that, <laughs> I did stuff, <laughs> like, <laughs> so that way I didn't get caught, but I was smoking weed my whole time I was on parole, yeah. um, but, uh, I made sure I didn't get caught, you know, uh, I did it smart, I wasn't hanging out in, in the streets doing dumb stuff like I was before, but I still did stuff that I could have went Back to prison for, you know, and I still, uh, you know, I didn't really understand how to cherish my freedom. I got pulled over. I take that back. I did get one violation. I got pulled over. That's what, that's what woke me up. So I was released from prison May of 2017. Um, My fiance, which uh, is crazy. We used to date back when we were kids. We were 12. Yeah. We used to date. And then I got out and uh, we linked up on Facebook and she had two sons already. Uh, 
but we hit it off. We hit it off, and she helped me with everything. You know, uh, this woman's a great woman. Picked me up out the dirt. You yeah. know, dust me off multiple times, and it's crazy because, um, I watch my mother do the same exact thing with my father for over a decade. So it was pretty comfortable to you at the same sense and sense yeah, what you so, knew and what you saw. So um, I ended up getting pulled over. What's crazy is I was on my way to get weed. Good thing they pulled me over before. Yeah. Um, They pulled me over and my PO put a hold on me. She put the hold on me. It was a weekend. So I didn't end up getting released till I believe it was like a Tuesday. So I had to sit in the county for three, four days. Man, that was the worst. I was like, I just got out. I just got used to wearing my own drawers and my own clothes again. Man, it's I got funny, bro. It's not funny. I promise you, I'm not <laughs> laughing. Not... Just the way you said it. Away, I'm... No, I get it. But I'm like, man, I'm wearing somebody else's drawers again. And it was just like, dude, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And it was so stressful. I was like, oh my God, I can't do this again. Man, I call my girl every day. Every day, and I was like, please, y'all, please just call the PO, calling my mama, mama, please, y'all, please call the PO, figure this out. Because I, you know, all I all I was doing was driving without a license, man. We're yeah. like, what? I was going to my guy house to play the game line, but yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm like, man, please just please tell him, please just tell him to just let me out. Like, yeah. come on, this ain't it ain't ain't, ain't nothing warrant this, you know. So that showed me like I just did that one little thing, and that could have just cost me my freedom. And even though I had did three years and I went back for 18 months and then I got out. Nah, they didn't just, whew. Yeah. I was like, oh man, okay, I'm done now. So I went and sat my ass down. But after that, um, I was still dealing with uh, death around me, you know, close people to me passing away, getting killed due to street violence. And um, I was using drugs uh, to cope. Oh. I was trying shit, everything. And this is marijuana, I take it? Shit, I was doing cocaine. Um, I was doing Molly. I tried acid. Um, yeah. Codeine, you know. I was just doing dumb shit, you know. It was, I had a lot of stoner friends, hippie friends. They, they, they got the drugs easy. I got it easy, yeah. you know. So I didn't have to pay for the shit. I'm hanging around them. Hey, bro, here you go. And, uh, you know, I was always the popular guy out of the, the group. So, you know, people would flock to me, you know, before this, before boxing, I was really big into music. You know, I was trying to become a rapper. Oh, wow. Everybody wanted to be a rapper. But I, I really, <laughs> I really had bars, though. Bars, yeah. bars. Uh, So people was like, man, that kid's going to make it one day, you know. And I grew up singing, so I could sing. So you know, I was naturally gifted and talented. I grew up in a church choir, so I really knew how to sing. You, well, sang. People, yeah. <laughs> people say it's a different. You yeah, know, uh, Steve Harvey told him it's a difference between singing and, and singing. singing. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a big difference. So, um, shout out to moms and pops. My pops can actually blow. Uh, but um, yeah, I battled that. And you calling? Are you listening? Tune in every week. Lifeline Oh yeah, I'm going lifeline